How's it going, lads and ladies? It is Petrifying Pumpkins here, and I am joined, as you can see, by Frank. Frank, what should I call you these days? It was PSVR Frank, then it was Firewall Frank. What's what kind of Frank are you these days? I think just just normal old Frank is fine. Just Frank. Well, just Frank is good. Yeah, I like baby. to hear it. Just Frank. Thank. First of all, thank you for taking time out of your day to join me. Appreciate it. And uh, <laughs> how have you been? How are you? Oh, really good, man. All things considered, like I was telling you earlier, I mean, a lot going on, trying to figure out what really are the big next steps. But uh, overall, just staying super positive. I mean, that's all you can really do in life. All right. Delighted to hear. So, Frank, I have prepared for you a series of questions. Uh, if you would be kind enough as to tackle them for me in your own time. I right. can try my best, sir. Uh, I think, per well, personally, anyway, I'm very interested in your story. I'm sure there's other people out there who'd like to hear it, too. So that's why we're here. My first question is, you had a very successful YouTube channel back before you joined First Contact Entertainment. And if I remember right, it was even ahead of Without Parole, who are kind of the top dogs now in PS for your YouTube content. So my first question is, how did you start getting into making YouTube videos and why did you pick PS for your as your topic? So I started making YouTube videos in college, probably even before college. I think I started with skateboarding videos and like junior high school through high school and like jackass videos and stuff because that was super popular. Nice. Uh, got to college, started a like TV net show on the college network and we just decided to like upload those videos that we would make to youtube but it wasn't really much of anything and these were still semi earlier youtube days so there wasn't like a there wasn't like a mass of content people weren't going for streamers or anything but i had watched this video by mike wesh called an anthropological look at youtube uh one night when i was tripping balls with my buddy and it completely changed the way that i saw online cultures and like saw myself in the space um, and just how you're able to kind of present yourself as you really are on YouTube versus these kind of like characters that we see every single day in life or really you see a person, you don't really know their true self and YouTube, you can really kind of get to your true self and everything, which is really cool. And so I, I, I knew that I wanted to get into YouTube then, uh, but I just was doing it kind of half assed and just messing around and not really paying attention to it. Fast forward to post college working as the manager at the restaurant, PSVR 1 came out. I, I got a game. Uh, I think it was Weeping Doll. I'll never forget this. And <laughs> it was honestly one of the, the worst games yeah, I ever played. I remember that one. Uh, yeah, it was terrible. It was terrible. I, I, I mean, I can't remember anything about it now other than like the creepy doll on the cover. Uh, but I remember feeling super burned from the game and then going on YouTube, going online, seeing if there were any videos, seeing if there were any reviews about it. And no one had put anything up. And I was like, oh. I mean, if I were someone else, I would not really want to get burned on this game, too. So, hey, why don't I just do, like, a little mini review of this game, put it up on YouTube, see what happens. Uh, I put it up, and then the next morning I had, like, 300 views, which to me was, like, mind-blowing. I, I was so excited. I was so hyped. Uh, people were really into it. Uh, I got a lot of feedback because back then I was, like, talking like this because I was kind mm. of, like, not ready to use my voice. And so I got a lot of, like, dude, you should just do, like, creepy pastas or, like, work on your voice. And so kind of did that, kept working on it, got new mics, got new blah, 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 so on and so forth, and then just really fell in love with it. Uh, I knew I always wanted to do it, and um, that was just the perfect time. I saw a hole, and I filled it. All right. You filled it nicely. Filling the holes. Say. <laughs> yes sir <laughs> um okay so you kind of took off then you kind of got fairly big i would say you were kind of very recognizable at least in the ps viewer space uh so at some point presumably hess or someone from first contact entertainment approached you about this job for first contact entertainment and yeah my... so hess reached out to me on facebook which okay is wild well, yeah. uh i had no idea he even reached out to me uh, and then David Jagno from Upload VR sent me a message on Twitter that was like, yo, man, uh, Hess is trying to get a hold of you from First Contact. Um, check your Facebook messages. Can I connect you all? Um, and then he connected me. We played around a firewall zero hour together. Hess teabagged me a bunch of times. Nice, as he does. Um, and it was, yeah, of course. And I think like <laughs> Shabs was in there. A couple other dudes from the team were in there. And I just didn't really, I didn't know um and next thing i knew i started working remotely for them helping make some content through my channel through their channels uh and then i think six months seven months later i moved out to california oh okay so my question for you about that then is when you were asked to join first contact you know full-time 
was that a difficult mm -hmm. decision for you because you had already built up this platform on YouTube and you're kind of going places, you know, in that regard? Was it something difficult or did you just jump at it straight away? Uh, it was semi difficult. I mean, in, in all honesty, the YouTube channel on top of wanting to build a community and having people kind of feel like there was a place that they belonged. I also considered it a bit of like a living resume. Um, and initially when I got hired on at first contact, they were okay with me continuing the channel. Um, so my assumption was that I was going to kind of get to keep making videos and this and that. And then as it played out, that was not the case. Mm -hmm. Um, which was like, I, for a while there, I had like, it was just real unhappy on my mental health because I, I really enjoyed the community. I really enjoyed making content. I really enjoyed updating videos and this and that. And there were probably like six months where I was just super depressed. No um, and then once I got over that bump and kind of started doing stuff more at FCE, I just had, I don't know, you know, it's like everything time. You just kind of forget about it. And like mm -hmm. as upsetting as it was for me, I was just busy with so many other things that I just didn't even think about it. Okay. Um, so, I mean, this is kind of a, a question based on what you, the answer you've just given me there, but do you think, Yeah. do you think if you knew that going into it, would you still have accepted the job? That's a hard one just because hindsight 2020 and yeah. everything that happened and this and that, but probably yes, because it was my first crack into game dev as like a professional sense. And especially considering like the, the level of that studio. So it was first party PlayStation title. I mean, mm -hmm. I bled blue for as long as I could remember. So just the thought of being able to kind of work hand in hand with PlayStation um, got me super excited and was really one of the reasons I started the channel too. Um, so I probably would have taken a bit more prodding, but I think it would have worked out anyway, just because like the amount of stuff that I learned, the amount of things that I was able to do would just, I mean, I, who knows what would have happened with the channel had I kept going during then, but it was running the channel at that time was very stressful for me too. Cause I was working like 12 hour shifts and then I would get home and stay up till like five in the morning, working on videos and getting them yes. out. Um, so it was, it was hard. And I was, I've always been a like, try to push a video out every day, respond to every single comment, try to stay completely on top of the news, everything extremely relevant, everything, the newest information, which just kind of got to me a little bit. Yeah. So it was nice too to get kind of a little break from that and also know that you have this like safety net of a good job and kind of a start towards a career because I knew I wanted to get into entertainment. Um, I've always wanted to. And so this was kind of like my foot through the door. Mm -hmm. And now... I have that on a resume, which is great. And I have all of that like learning that I got, which is amazing. And now I'm back with the channel. Uh, so I think all in all, yeah, I probably was still taking it because I mean, I'm a big, like if an opportunity comes and it sounds exciting, like go for it. Totally. All right. Understandable. Uh, uh, that, that being said, mm -hmm. in the future, uh, I would prefer to align with brands and companies unless it's like the, I don't know what the dream job would be like that would make me stop ever doing that ever again. I have, I don't know if it exists in my mind, um, but I'd like to continue making the content and making stuff, even if I do get a job with another company, because I know a lot of companies are fine with that. It just happened to be that we were first party PlayStation um and because i was just so playstation specific at that time it could have been misconstrued as like insider trading okay. for content you know what i mean like if i said something people were like oh he works at playstation yeah. you know that's yeah. probably the answer and that could bite you in the ass Shit, yeah all right i mean you can kind of see where that comes from as well like you you can kind of get us um mm -hmm. so my next question is this was your first job inside the gaming industry so you went from youtube and to being actually inside the industry how did the reality of the job line up with what you expected uh, was it a difficult transition and also as well i don't believe there was a community manager role before you joined first contact i could be wrong but when you came on board is it something that you kind of had to figure out yourself or was there somebody there to kind of show you the ropes as you were doing it uh, there was a girl named jess there she was awesome she really helped a lot of everything she was doing more of like the pr side of stuff i think they hired a community manager at one point in time but from what i gathered that the person that was doing the job just didn't do it to what their expectations were and it was like a never public role so i think they were excited to have me on there and um i it was overwhelming at first at the studio because like i'm this youtuber that gets hired and all the 
honestly, first contact was not like, like there's, I've, I've seen a lot of developers and they have a lot of younger guys work there and kids out of college, you know what I mean? Like most independent developers, it's, it's a younger community. Um, sometimes it's a little bit, when I got there, it was all super seasoned vets. Like these guys have had 20 plus years in the industry was pretty much the average. Uh, so I came through the doors, everyone was like, who the hell is this guy? Like, what the hell is he doing here? And so it took me a little while to kind of get that respect in the studio of like, oh, he, he knows what he's doing. He's professional. Like, this isn't just some asshole off the Internet that Hess brought in uh, because he thought that he was fun or, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I think that that was my biggest hurdle was just to kind of like get the respect from the team and see that they really cared. A couple of guys were great from the start and like were already fans of the content. So they understood that I had like a good work ethic. But at the end of the day, I mean, they pulled someone from the other side of the country that they really knew nothing about whatsoever and just prayed that it was going to work out. And thankfully, everybody loved me and I was super helpful and helped every area of the team. But uh yeah, I got there and really had no idea what was going to go on. Uh, I thought that I would have a whole lot more freedom with what was going on. But then you learn about this thing called a legal department. Mm -hmm. um, and it just changed the entire way that I had to act and work with the community and this and that. And personally, I don't really think that it's the best way to run socials and run a studio, especially when you're doing live ops and you're doing... Um, games that are constantly updating and games that need feedback from the community it's just you lock yourself into these choices and these things and you aren't really able to react because like let's say there was an issue with the game even if i would wanted to respond to the community about the issue with the game mm -hmm. it would take crafting a response sending that off to pr getting that response approved and then finally being able to respond and so in that meantime, you got these people that are like, why the hell aren't you saying anything? Why aren't yeah. you doing any of this? Why aren't yeah. you doing that? And it's like, I'm sorry, you guys. I'm seriously just following protocol. It would I could get myself into a giant pit of trouble if I say anything other than what's been approved yeah. um, from like partner guidelines. It's just the red um, tape is crazy. Yeah, that was. It's exactly the red tape's crazy. And and uh, the thing is, I completely understand it. I know where they're coming from, and I do not hate them at all for it. And I don't feel like. There's no like sense of like, oh, these people were bad or these people made yeah. this. It was just like at, when you're at working at a multinational corporation and, and, and any little thing people could try to nitpick and come at you for or sue you for, it, it, you have to be super, super safe. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that they're slowly adjusting and realizing with the times, but that's still they have to be very careful and they have to be very safe and cautious with everything they do versus like. A developer that has no one to speak up to or no worries about this, they can just do whatever the hell they want. And traditionally, I've noticed that that's what we see in the VR space because most developers are independent developers. So it was like very hard for the community to understand that although Firewall and First Contact and Entertainment don't feel like God of War or The Last of Us um, and Naughty Dog and Sony Santa Monica, mm -hmm. it's the same vibe. It's the same sort of like machine behind it. And it was not something folks were used to in the VR space. And uh, I think that that was kind of rough. All right. Interesting. So they just had to make sure they were covering their ass constantly. Yes. Yes. Always. Okay. So my next question then is you joined First Contact right after Zero Hour released, uh, but you were there for the development of Solaris and Firewall Ultra from the very beginning. So how did it differ jumping in on a project that was kind of post-launch versus being there from the beginning and did it feel like jumping into the deep end abyss when with zero hour was already like you know full steam ahead compared to those other titles thankfully i had already been covering zero hour on my channel so it, i kind of felt like i was a bit of the like like i had a connection to where the development of the game had been going same with you you know what i mean you had yeah. been covering it early so you kind of felt like you were attached to the title before it even came to existence mm -hmm. Um, so I had already felt like I had been a part of that community, especially because we were doing like uh, top clip contests. We were trying to run tournaments and stuff even before I had joined the team. So that felt like a real natural transition. Uh, and it didn't really feel overwhelming, especially because I wasn't building the game. It wasn't hard. A lot of things were kind of lined up for me. Uh, the other games were a little more difficult and uh, a little more like in the process of, it, it's very interesting to see how a game develops from just basic concept to people take a whole bunch of numbers and turn them into visuals and it, it, it blows my mind like i don't think that your average player really understands what goes into making a game from scratch 
Uh, a lot of people think that there's like, oh, all this stuff is already ready to go. Oh, Unreal already has like a first person shooter thing. All you got to do is kind of add a couple things here and drag there and, and you're drop. done and drag and drop. And <laughs> yeah, while some games can be drag and drop when you're dealing with a company that makes like bespoke assets and more bespoke titles, it really, the process is nuts, man. And there are just so many checks and like, I never understood what cost was and like understanding like the different memory usage and how textures need to be applied and the different levels of textures and why this looks a certain way and why we can't do things a certain way. It was really cool to be in there understanding everything. And it gave me further insights into kind of sharing with the community when I was able to share. Um, so I'd say I really enjoy being there from the conception rather than joining right at the end, just because it's, it's fun to like be a part of a project yeah. and see it grow and test it every day and see the changes that they make when they're testing and like come up with a cool idea and everyone's like, oh damn, that would be a cool idea. And then we try it and it either works or it's shit. Um, but something about that iterative process is really cool versus like just working on something established. Uh, it was fun to work on something established, but if I could do it all over again, I, I would have loved to even join like when they were starting Firewall, that would have been super mm -hmm. cool. Like some of the pictures that they would have when there's just like three or four of them in an office setting up their PCs. And it, it was just like, everybody looks like they're like 20 years old and it's <laughs> nuts how much game dev ages you. Like our CTO over the like eight years went from like, full head of hair to like super stressed gray hair Jesus. Uh, full okay. head of black hair to like super stressed with gray hair and he's always stressed about it but i think he looks great with the gray hair uh, <laughs> but uh yeah man it's like it's like those lincoln before and after war photos um when you see before and after a studio starts and their games come out it's it's yeah. very it's nuts to see like that stress and everything how it can affect a person's body you all got the thousand um, yard stare now yeah dude <laughs> Uh, okay. So, my next question is, you were there when Firewall Zero Hour had the infamous Operation Nightfall incident. Uh, so that must have been difficult, especially in your role as a community manager. Can you say anything, like, about that time? Yeah, yeah a night fail, as the community yeah. so lovingly called <laughs> I didn't want to say uh, it. Yeah, dude, that, that, was, that was rough. You, you get your gray I mean? hairs because there. At the end of the day... Yeah, well, I had no idea that that was going to happen because I wasn't in on the dev. And when you're trying stuff on like our side and we're dealing with our QA and our support system, most things are working really well. Mm -hmm. uh, but then once it hits like the live environment and you, you get things out to scale, you start to see different problems arise that were unexpected. Um, and sadly, just because of how the VR is, it was very, very hard to test fully at scale uh, before anything came out. And so that one was just kind of like a stress because it was the first time where it was like, oh, I really want to like respond to the community and tell them this and tell them we're working on this and tell them our dates and tell them we're trying to get started and not really apologize, but you know what I mean? Say like, yeah, I completely understand your frustrations and this and that. And mm -hmm. while I, while that's okay to hear, like people want harder information and harder details about why this and that are happening. And I was not able to do that. And it was my first time really hitting that wall when it came to working with the community and it was not fun um i got like death threats i had like Jesus. hate groups made up about me like it was not so i can't even imagine working on some giant title uh like call of duty or something what those people get um but yeah man it was it was not the greatest time in my life but thankfully we got through that mm -hmm. um and then zero hour just kind of kept going and going and going yeah you definitely saw the dark side of community management i guess oh my god yeah like if anything some things that people tell me from this they're like well what did you learn from the job and i was like well i absolutely learned how not to do things <laughs> um specifically within the vr community um and so yeah trial by fire but at the end of the day if everything goes right you don't learn anything um so i think that it's best that i was able to be like yeah we fucked up but um here's what I learned from my fuck ups. Yeah. Um, so that way, if there are future companies that I get to work with, even like what I'm doing right now, speaking with Reggie from strange games on D day enhanced, he was, I had just uh, like play tested the game the other day and he had a bunch of like what he would consider and what a lot of us in the VR community consider kind of jankiness to it. Mm -hmm. um, and he was kind of trying new things with the controls. And it was like, 
something I learned from Firewall Ultra and from Zero Hour is that like there's all these other established VR shooters out there that people really enjoy, um, and there's no reason right now to try and like remake the wheel. Um, so one of the big inputs I gave to him was I was like, look at what other games are doing, look at what people are really enjoying playing, and kind of match your controls to those, yeah. and that way when players really get into your game, there's not this whole giant amount of friction of like how the hell do I even play this? It's literally like, a, oh, this is. This is like every other game that I've ever played. And so that right off the bat is a learning thing that I got right away and was so happy to be able to like share with another developer and help him work on something so that on day one, we're not getting that same feedback from a similar community. It's like, yeah. I got the feedback, I gave the feedback, and now we're actually able to implement the feedback, uh, which is huge. I'm really enjoying that loop. Uh, and I'm liking the, I'm, lo I'm enjoying being able to work with a team that can completely just listen to their community and any overwhelming feedback can be okay we hear you and we're going to adjust and we'll adjust and see what y'all think and then go from there All right. um versus kind of like this is what we're going to do right, that's and i do have more questions later on about uh Please. your work with uh, reggie and whatnot but uh, a side question first what's your dog's name i've seen the dog pop up there in the background oh bruno bruno, bruno. there we go uh, yeah bruno i like to call him <laughs> bruno lini like Mussolini. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I got, I gotta be careful who I'm calling him that in front of. Right, um, but yeah, no, nah, he, he's the man. I got him on Valentine's day last year. It's like a Valentine's day present to myself. Oh, very nice. And, uh, dude, he's my, he's my best buddy. Love of your but life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my burner. Right. <laughs> hey, love of my life. <laughs> All right. Moving on. The firewall IP is owned by Sony, of course. But Solaris yep. is something their first contact owned themselves. So how different was it for you to work on each of those IPs? Presumably, obviously, you've already said us you were more restricted with Firewall. But is there any kind of, can you go into detail on how you had to operate with Firewall? Or maybe give an example of things you could do when it came to Solaris that you couldn't do with Firewall? Yeah, like uh, when it came to operating, so like community stuff. So with Solaris... With Firewall, if I wanted to take, like, let's say you made a video of Firewall and you gave it to me and I was like, oh, this is an awesome video. I'd love to share this on social media. It would have to go through this whole machine of, like, I have to erase your tag. I might have to get, like, a write-up from you to say that I'm allowed to use this within something else. If I was able to live stream it, it was kind of a loophole around it. But it made creating creative content for the game very difficult because it was, like, Oh, you have to follow all these steps and all this and that. Solaris, on the other hand, a whole lot more freedom to just kind of do whatever I wanted to do. Nice. Um, the only downside that we had done with Solaris, in my opinion, was that there was a lot of like discussions on working with Oculus and working with this and that. And something that I have learned, especially about Oculus at that time, is that they were a very big like over promise under deliver kind of company um i think that they were really just starting to get their footing in vr and footing and working with devs and foot in with that and it kind of it felt like we put a lot of eggs in the like working with oculus basket and then in the end it felt like we were kind of just out there on our own when it finally launched okay. and so i had had all these plans of like well let's start our community let's Let's start working with feedback. Let's let the team, let's get, let the community get in on betas. Let's like, let's get some, let's get people playing this before it comes out mm -hmm. and kind of follow the, follow the rules that like all these other devs are doing. And uh, it, because we kind of wanted to, we were going to try and work with Oculus and they had some plans for this and that. We ended up waiting for them and waiting for them and waiting for them and waiting for them and then like at the last minute it was like oh it's not gonna happen frank what are you gonna do and i tried to just reach out to a bunch of people and had them jump in and play the game with us and set up some play times and this and that and really tried to push as hard as i could but it was like i had what i had really wanted was impossible because as soon as solaris got like cons like the conception i thought like let's let's start the discord now let's get the community growing let's get people in there let's start getting feedback let's mm -hmm. let them see that and it was a lot of like, yeah, I'd like to do that, Frank, but let's 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 wait and see what what's going to happen over here first, and that like wait and see, wait and see, wait and see came, and then it's like, oh shit, launch is like a month away. All right. Um, because yeah, I wanted we all wanted to do so much more with Solaris. I wanted to do so much more with Solaris, and there's still like a pretty devout small Solaris community that play on Quest all the time. 
uh, at least once or twice a week. So it's been kind of amazing to see that that has continued on for this many years. Yeah. Um, I've had a couple of them write out to me that's like, oh my God, Solaris changed my life. Like, it's the greatest game that I've ever played. I absolutely love it. Um, I had someone write the other day that was like, could you send me like any little bit of art or something that hasn't been shared before just because this game really does mean so much to me. Yeah. And when you see comments like that, it's like, oh my God, like I'm so glad that I'm doing what I'm doing because there's very few other industries where you're going to get that kind of feedback yeah. from a player Lovely. Um, or from just a person. Yeah. So it was, it was weird. Um, I definitely wanted to do more with Solaris, but what can you do? Okay, I, had no I was idea. only one person. I had no idea that you were kind of as restricted with, Solaris as oh you ended up being kind of as restricted as you were with Firewall with Sony. Uh so that's Yeah, interesting, right? we just we ended up kind of doing it to ourselves and it wasn't like we wanted to be it was just kind of like we had been semi promised a couple not really promised but told that these certain things were going to happen and then it, they just never came to fruition. Okay. All right. So Next up then, uh, Firewall Zero Hour got years of post-launch support, 10 seasons of content, but Solaris kind of came out and didn't ever really get anything similar like that. Was this due to Solaris just not being as popular or was it more to do with the lack of funding seeing as you know it wasn't backed by Sony like Firewall was? Or was it because Firewall Ultra kind of entered the scene at a certain point and you kind of changed focus to that? Yeah, I mean, it was it's kind of like a mix of everything okay. uh, without going like too deep into it. But like there were plans to do more with Solaris and add a whole lot more to it. But it was just kind of one of those cost versus time versus what are other people doing versus they need to be on this project. Um, and we can't have everybody working on this other project. Like we, we need a certain number of people working on zero hour working. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it just kind of it wasn't able to really get its wings and then we started work on ultra and it was just like all hands on ultra okay all right fair enough um maybe if solaris had launched with like crazy crazy numbers and like through the roof and continued going going it could be a different story but because it was kind of like a not so hard hitting launch i think that like the the emphasis to continue pushing on that was kind of laid back uh, not to mention working with Oculus at that time was very difficult. Like you would do all this stuff for your game and then they would update their back end and they would never warn you and it would break a whole bunch of stuff in your game. So yeah. something that we would have working a day before, I have to pull guys that they're working on something else. They're busy and now they got to come in and work on this because they got no forewarning that this was going to happen. Um, and I haven't worked in Oculus Dev or Meta Dev in a minute. So I, I'm sure, I'm hoping that they've gotten feedback and have learned and they're, they're, the system's gotten a bit smoother and a bit better and a bit easier to work on their platform. But yeah, at that time, it was still a bit of the like Wild West when it came to um, Quest development. And that that was tough, man. Yeah. Like like our entire like squad system broke because they did a different update. Our entire like add a buddy system broke because they did a different update Jeez. and um then we didn't fill out one form one time on their website so they just shut the game down completely and it was like geez like <laughs> you know what i mean yeah, and it sounds so, like a bit of an they, impossible situation like yeah you were just constantly constantly like pushing to do something and getting surprised by stuff and things were really changing because they were still really working on their interface at that time they were really still working on everything it was it was getting to where it's at today but it was it was week by week getting massive changes um, because I would argue to say that even Quest 2 when it first came out was kind of still in like a beta phase when it came to Oculus um, UI and like the software and the home and everything because mm -hmm. it was just con it was always updating. Even now it updates um, semi-frequently but nowhere near where it was before. Um, so yeah, that was a, that was a mountain. Stable, yeah. All right. So that sounds stressful. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not the one making the code and everything, but like know, our engineers yeah. were like stressing. I can imagine. Uh, okay. So Firewall Zero Hour is probably one of the most successful first party PSVR 1 games, at least when it comes to multiplayer. Uh, so did you mm -hmm. guys always know there'd be a sequel to us? And can you say anything about how Firewall Ultra came into being? Like, was it something that First Contact pitched to Sony or was it something that Sony were like really eager to get onto you for a sequel for PSVR 2? 
it was kind of i don't think that there were i mean when you work in game dev anytime you have a new idea everybody's like oh we'll put it in the next version you know what i mean like mm -hmm. that's like the joke it's kind of like okay firewall three or firewall two yeah, yeah, yeah we'll do that firewall two um, so I think that like, there was a want for that, but it wasn't until that, like we had Sony reach out and was like, yeah, we really want this, that it, it came to be, uh, I mean, I think that we were working on some other little side projects, playing with this and that, seeing what people thought about those. Um, there was a bit of like silence for a little while and then it ended up that it was like, yeah, we want firewall ultra. Um, and so we kind of started working on that. All right. Um, okay, so Firewall Ultra is an interesting name, I've always thought. Uh, can you say anything about why this name was picked instead of something like a Firewall 2 or Zero Hour 2? Like the lack of a number 2 and like the reuse of many of the Firewall Zero Hour kind of assets, like the maps, contractors, weapons, kind of gives it a feel that maybe it's more of a 1.5 or a remake or a, like an Ultimate Edition or something. So was, was that kind of the intention or what can you say about that? I I didn't name it. It was our so Firewall Ultra was actually the code name before it was just Ultra uh, was the code name before anything ever really came to be. Like that was like every company does that for most of their projects. Just in case anything gets leaked, you can't really know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then it just happened to be that folks love the name Firewall Ultra because it didn't imply that it was like a direct sequel. Um, it didn't imply that it was like a re just an update. It kind of just like implied that like this is like. I th the, like I think like uh, what, what's that movie where you turn it up to 11 like that's the vibe you know what I mean like ultra is like it just sounds awesome so it's yeah. like let's go with that name um, and I'm thinking that that was kind of the thought behind it there was a big uh, there, we, there was an emphasis on making sure that it wasn't sold as like a sequel uh, but there was also an emphasis on making sure that it wasn't sold as just like an update to zero hour because it wasn't it was like a complete rebuild of everything mm -hmm. um but because it was that weird gray area uh where it was like an update to maps i mean it's like counter-strike i always say like counter-strike has had the same damn maps for whatever years yeah. they've had the same damn guns for however many years they've been doing but they just constantly like update the visuals update mm -hmm. the gameplay update little things here and there and it it felt a la like that vein versus a full on like, hey, hold on, this is a completely different game, y'all. It was more along the lines of these are some great places you know, and now we're kicking it up to the ultra settings. Okay. So would I be right in saying, like you said, that you didn't want it to come across as a sequel? The reason for that is probably like it improves sales when like people who might think they've missed the first one, so they won't go for the second one. Is that the kind of thinking behind that? maybe i don't even know if that was any kind of thought to that just because there was no like single player aspects to it so okay. i don't feel like players you know what i mean like yeah, if it's no, a I single player you. game then hell yeah you need to work on better but i don't know if that was even considered when they were thinking about the name right. um yeah okay so next question so firewall ultra did have a troubled launch as I'm, i don't need to tell you i'm sure the first month or two <laughs> it was very difficult to match make for example with the full squad uh, many players kind of felt like there should have been a beta period that could have prevented this. So what would what would your thoughts be on the base? I know you probably can't say too much, but anything you can say on a potential. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would have loved to have a beta, you know what I mean? But a lot of that was just out of my hands. Uh, mm -hmm. I have always pushed for betas, especially when it comes. I mean, like every multiplayer shooter does betas. Call of Duty does betas. Battlefield does betas. Fortnite is basically still in beta. Mm -hmm. um they just keep iterating um and so that is something that i really wanted but it just kind of never came to and like with any other vr titles and stuff once you go to scale there's just like it's impossible to get there dude there were just not that when we were making the game there no one had psvr 2s except for us and like maybe one or two other devs because the hardware wasn't even at the point where it was getting widespread and wide scale so even if we wanted to test anything it was just with a very very small group of people and while everything was working on that end once you hit the big numbers it's everything changes so though i i think every probably game dev feels this way that when they launch the game they just cross their fingers and pray to god that it even can work yeah. um so most of us were although there were issues on day one that we absolutely like understand and this and that it was kind of a relief initially that it was just like okay it's working at scale awesome like 
at least people can get in and play. At least they can enjoy the maps. At least they can get in MPV and shoot. You know what I mean? It wasn't yeah. like a connection to server loss, connection to host loss. It wasn't like black screening constantly. Um, so I saw that as, you know what I mean? Like, hey, at least this, it could have been a million times worse. Yeah. Um, but it also could have been a million times better. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? What can you do? All right. Uh, very fair answer. So aside from the technical issues, which kind of poured a bit of water on Ultra's launch, there was multiple design decisions that were made, which kind of rubbed people the wrong way, or at least certain people. So the eye tracking, the ADS eye tracking, the ADS grenades, or sorry, the eye track grenades being maybe the two most prominent ones there. But there's also other things like, you know, no manual reloads, despite now having sense controllers instead of the M controller. So did you foresee these decisions getting the reaction that they did? And was there like a pressure from Sony to be including things like eye tracking as much as possible, for example, or? I wouldn't say? call it a pressure, but there was definitely like a, hey, you guys are like a first party title on this new hardware and it would be really great if you leaned into all these features, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. hey, it would be, it'd be really fucking yeah. great if you lean yeah. into this stuff. Just holding the gun, uh, kind gun of, in the whole Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, no, you know, just, just like, so it wasn't directly like, you have to do this yeah. um, in any way, form or fashion. And it was a lot of us just kind of wanting to test out new things. Honestly, although the ADS, I think, was a hit or miss when it came to feedback for it, I can guarantee you that within 10 to 15 years, if not less, you are going to see that mechanic used in tons of VR shooters. Once eye tracking is considered a standard, um, I really think that we came up with a mechanic that a lot of people are going to use. I mean, hell, even Resident Evil kind of uses a little bit of a variation on that when it comes to doing their things. It's not so tight. My big thing was like, I wanted there to be parity between two-handed and ADS from day one. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we finally got to that point, but that was like my big one. I was like, you know what? I don't, I think ADS is cool for players that I saw like a lot of like people that just initially maybe don't understand that you got to do this in VR. It was a lot easier for them to just kind of hit the ADS, move around, hit the ADS, move around. And it mm -hmm. gave them a much more traditional sense to a shooter now when you're launching on a new piece of hardware that people are getting into and they want to be goofy and go around and not play like games that they're used to playing, you're absolutely going to get feedback, especially while we're in like the gorilla tag, in my opinion, generation of VR right now. Like we're getting younger folks in there that really want like something different than the game that they're playing. But I suspect in five to 10 years time, you will see a lot more games that are similar to how like ultra handled it's handled the way that it, it's ease and access of use. Like literally anybody, even like a grandmother, as long as I can figure out how to get into the match, could probably play Ultra. It's not the most difficult thing to figure out once you get the controls. Um, and I think once people get that, I call it like the honeymoon phase, you know what I mean? Like I had years and years of going hard and trying every little thing in VR. And like, it was nice to kind of be able to really enjoy a beautiful space with great visuals, great graphics, really great sound, really cool map design and not have to like be all over my room. But I know that I am not the majority of players thinking that right now because the majority of people haven't spent like 10,000 hours in VR already at this point there some of them have never even tried vr and when you throw them in something like that on their first game mm -hmm. it's a little confusing because they're expecting a lot more but i can guarantee you guarantee you once that feeling of having to like interact with every single little thing and all the time and every single game you have wears off and they want some other games where you can still enjoy the style of gameplay that you like but with a little less like stress and effort and not having a have a full room that i can move around in mm -hmm. uh you're gonna see more games and titles come up like that i i really do think that ultra was in many ways ahead of its time and in many ways just kind of not aligning with what would be considered the vr market at the moment all right well that's actually like <laughs> i have to remind myself to come back to this video in 10 years time and see did frank predict the future Here correctly you know that would be fascinating to see um all right. I mean, think about it like this, like arcade games were huge when you would like go to the place and you jump on there and you, you push all the sticks and you do all the things and there yeah. were all these different arcade games. Now arcades are dead. People are just playing on a controller where they're not even moving their body or doing any kind of anything. Like it's an inevitable transition. It's just how long is it going to take? Um, but yeah, I would be very excited to see where we're at in 10 years time um, mm -hmm. for those predictions for sure, sir. Yeah, 100%. 
so I briefly mentioned it there in that last question, the AIM controller. So I just want to bring up, did you lads, when you were at First Contact, did you ever think when you were making Ultra, it was like a potential AIM 2 ever in the discussion? Like, did you ever think that maybe this would be something that would happen? Or did you know from the very beginning it was just going to be these sense controllers and that was it? I believe that there may have been an ask at one point in time. I'm not 100% privy to like all that information because I can just tell you that we never developed with any kind of concept of an AIM-2 in mind because it okay. never existed. Um, but I do think that at one point in time there was discussion like, oh, should there be an AIM-2? And I think that the overall consensus was kind of like, well, a lot of players are buying into this um, system. They're having to buy the PS5. They're having to buy the PSVR2. They're having to buy the game. You throw on a whole nother piece of hardware on top of that, and it, it, it creates even more friction into the entry versus you have these amazing controllers, honestly, best-in-class controllers, mm -hmm. great haptics, great feel, great ergonomics. Um, it's It felt like a no-brainer we want to use these new controllers we want to use all these new buttons versus kind of like going back to it was and catering to a crowd that's just going to like get this and maybe making it more open for everybody that has psvr2 and it's not like oh i gotta like go buy the gun thing now too yeah, yeah. um and that has to be my assumption i don't know speculating 100 percent, but i feel like that was probably the vibe i feel like i overheard something once about that but i was never privy to that any of that information when it came to like hardware stuff that was a lot higher level than me that's kind of given me like inspiration for another question if you don't mind but uh with fire was your hour obviously like a lot of people use the aim controller with us was there a way for you to like track like what percentage of people were using the aims versus dual shocks back then i don't i don't know if there was or wasn't um that was like those are called like uh uh what do they call those i forget the industry name for it but they're like dashboards the dashboards will call you all the numbers like how many players are playing each day how many players are in each month how many players are in right now and i'm sure that there was probably a filter to see what hardware they were using but from what i recall there was almost like a one-to-one -one, uh when it came to physical sales of the disc and an aim controller purchases specifically because we were bundled with the aim controller yeah, which yeah. made it a very easy like oh, I'll just go get the firewall bundle. Like, they don't even have the Farpoint bundle anymore. Once ours came out, there was a small number of Farpoint bundles left. I think they really did those in small numbers because I remember it was very hard to get when that first came out, mm -hmm. too. Um, and then that really pushed. I mean, I still see zero-hour aim controller bundles in the stores. So my assumption is that most players were on the aim controller. All right, so... How would you say, looking back at everything, the closure, our first contact, and how everything went, knowing what you know now, are you still happy to have had that experience? I know we kind of covered this earlier on, but uh, just like overall yeah. with everything that went down at the end. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Like the the relation at the end of the day, life is just all about the relationships that you make with people. Everything else is bullshit. I mean, we can we can say it is what it is, but especially games come and go. Like things come and go hardware comes and goes but people and the people that you're around and the, the people that you get to spend time with like until they like pass on they never really go and they still live in your head forever mm -hmm. um so just the like amazing artists that i've been able to collaborate with um it's be it's beautiful it was like a continuation of me going to college i went to liberal arts school so just i've been around artists my whole life i was raised like of a lover of fine art and cultured items like mm -hmm. that. So to be able to work with some people that are just doing like, like our character artists, like to watch him work on those busts, it was like, this is what it must have been like to like watch Michelangelo work in the day, back in the day. Like, nice. like the tiny little individual details on the pores and the hair follicles coming out and everything, like that blows my mind. And then you talk to these people and they're like the sweetest, kindest, honest, like, people you've ever met like a lot of like my experience with artists have been they're kind of douchebags um i i normally will respect a douchebag because as long as your art's good it's okay and like i yeah. can kind of get on a level with you but <laughs> like game artists for the most part that i met are some of the just sweetest kindest open-minded and and loving and like great people i've ever met now there's always going to be an like overly egotistical personality here and there but games really does seem to attract um just nice people that are love what they're doing and love making stuff that the community get to see. The big thing that every dev you'll ever talk to is just like, I just really want to be able to make something that, 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 the, that our players are going to get to check out. 
um, that our players are going to say, hey, that looks cool or that's really enjoyable. And it's really nice to to hear that versus like, I just want to get paid, um, yeah. which you which I personally never heard. Um, like no one that we worked with and maybe it was just because our studio was special and we got people that were very passionate about what they're doing, mm -hmm. but no one was just like, yo, I'm just clocking in for a paycheck. I don't give a shit about this. Um, and that was very, very refreshing for me to hear. Like it, it, it when you care about a project and the other people around you don't care, it, it sucks. Cause you're like, yeah. what the fuck, man? Like mm -hmm. we're all busting our ass and you don't even fucking care. Um, and when you're surrounded by these people that share that same vibe that you do and really, really just want to see everything better and better, it's it's amazing. And so those friends and those relationships and those people that I met and everything that I learned, you, I, you couldn't, you can't trade that for the world. There would have been no other way for me to ever get that experience. And working on my channel, I got to like work with devs and got to hang out with like a dev or two or interview now and then, but really to be able to get hands on and feel like you're part of a development team is mm -hmm. Something that I I think every gamer, if they have the option to, should like try to do that or try to get into game development because it'll really change the way that you look at things and the way that you look at your developers and the way that you like look at your community. It's it's there's a whole lot more going on than than a bunch of people trying to make a lot of money. Nice. Well, um, so yeah, I love that. If I wasn't already depressed about FCE clothes, I'm even more depressed now hearing that these lovely people have you know <laughs> lost their jobs. Uh, including yourself of yeah I, um, yeah i was uh smart enough to set up like a little discord for all of our community and like guys and so like we've all stayed super in touch since the day oh, that it nice. shut down like yeah, 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 yeah so everybody's helping each other out sharing jobs here and there like where they're finding job openings so it's been like really nice to go from having this these guys that we were at least talking to every day to i think that if it hadn't been done it would have felt a lot worse because it was a very smooth transition to like oh okay like at least we all still have each other right yeah. i kind of i don't know if you know what slack is but it's kind of like the industry app, standard for how you it's uh like how it's like it's basically discord but you got to pay for it um and it's how you would coordinate and send all your messages to your team and make sure everything's organized and so i just organized our discord very similar to our slack um and it's been really nice like it, i think you i can tell that people are really happy to have each other to talk in that so like we're all helping each other out Hess as soon as like the company went down that day he collected resumes from everyone and is reaching out to like everyone he knows in the industry he's busting his balls to like nice. try and get us work and try and get us jobs like he's done nothing but like he fought for the company as hard as he could when it came down to like the wire like I have never seen that man so stressed and just so like answering phone calls at four in the morning and working until like midnight just trying to like figure everything out and even after it all ended like i've seen a lot of ceos and stuff they just fuck off and never like they're done you know what i mean yeah, it's like yeah. i gotta cover my own ass and my people and he has gone out of his way already on multiple occasions to try and take care of all of us um and like i can't say enough for that he's been like one of the most amazing people i've ever had the pleasure to work with uh one of the kindest people i've ever mm -hmm. met in my life like 100%. he like at one point in time I had like I had gotten through a divorce and I didn't have anywhere to live and Hess was like you can even come stay with me for a couple of days and like I'll never forget that you know what I mean and so to like have this community and all these people it's just it's phenomenal and um, I I'm very lucky yeah, that I got lovely. to hang out with like great people that's lovely to hear man and fair mm -hmm. play to Hess as well um, yeah no Hess is the man he's the best yeah for hundred uh, percent I've just got a couple more questions we're nearly done so yeah. Even, yeah. Even though First Contact Entertainment has closed down last just last month, you and some others, I don't know the details there, how many or whatever, but from First Contact, you've already kind of teamed up with Strange Games in some cap sorry, some, some capacity uh, to help out with Honor and Juicy D-Day Enhanced. So what can you tell us about this kind of role you're doing? Or can you tell us about the other First Contact Entertainment people who are there? Or, you know, what uh, yeah, we got some artists over there. We have some programmers. Uh, we're working on uh, Dylan maybe helping out with some audio to really get those gun sounds on him better. I'm not sure yet. Uh, he's still kind of chatting. We're still kind of figuring everything out. But uh, yeah, I um, Reggie reached out to me uh, the first day and was like, hey, I might have a cool opportunity for y'all. He's like, I've been just busting my ass on this game. It's me and like this one other guy in the Netherlands. And we just haven't really had like a solid art team or guys that kind of know what they're doing on this. And mm -hmm. I've always wanted to grow the studio. And this seems kind of like a really great opportunity to work with some people that know what they're doing, know the space. And I was like, yeah. And I mean, I know the guys are looking for jobs. Like it, it felt good to be able to like get a handful of people work 
immediately. Mm. You know what I mean? Like I felt great. It was great that Reggie reached out. Like it was like a godsend of like, oh man, it's all stress. And I was like, oh, here's a guy that like wants a handful of guys to come help him and is willing to like pay. And is like, honestly, Reggie's a great guy. Like he's a super, super easygoing fella. He's super into the community. He just really cares about his title, really cares about his games, really cares about what he's doing. He's been at it since like 2009. So it's not like this is new to him. He's been doing it since like 360 days. And uh, we're really excited to kind of, juice a little more like juice into the uh projects and into like what he's got going on and kind of seeing where it can go from there um and yeah it's just really exciting stuff it's fun to still stay in the psvr space it's fun to stay in a multiplayer shooter space because yeah. honestly those are that will always be my favorite game like I, i'll fuck around and play a couple other games every now and again but unless it's got guns in it normally i'm not gonna have as much fun um and if it's not multiplayer i'm still not gonna have as much fun so it was a very smooth transition for me it wasn't like some my boss said the other day it's not like when like my pony my little pony reached out to me it was like we really want you to work here i'd be like oh, i mean i got nothing to do so i guess i'll do that it, it was very much so like oh hell yeah like perfect you're doing fit. really cool things you're you, yeah it was perfect fit like you're it's basically like battlefield in vr uh without destruction you know what i mean it's 64 mm -hmm. players tanks jeeps like multiple different classes multiple different weapons and whatever we can do to help polish that up and get kind of what he calls the jankiness the community calls the jankiness out of that will be really great um because in i think in its bones it's a really really fun game and it it does something that i don't believe a whole lot of other games offer um and i don't think any other games offer on playstation vr Uh, so I'm really, really excited to get DD out there and kind of hear the feedback from it. Um, we have a creator event coming up next Saturday, uh, and it's kind of like a, I don't know if this will come out before then or not. Um, but yeah, awesome. we're going to have a bunch of people that kind of make content and do this and that, get a little early look at the game, give us some feedback on the game. They'll be able to have videos ready for launch if they want to. And I really want to try to get as much. A big thing that I really enjoy when I was doing the channel was kind of getting early access to games because it could help your channel get a little kick. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would love, my big thing is I told Reggie is I would want to work with a lot of smaller and medium sized creators. I don't want to just go for like the big guys. Cause like, yeah, they're cool. And yeah, that's like advertising and this and that, but I think we should really like use our position to kind of raise other smaller creators up and give them chances that like, maybe they're not in the like meta meta creators program, mm -hmm. or maybe they can't reach out to the devs or most devs are just too busy. It's not that they don't want to work with them. It's just they don't have a guy like me on their payroll to be able to do all that work. And they don't even have the option to get someone like me on their payroll to do all that work and to reach out and get everybody. Um, and so I'm really excited about like doing stuff like that and just kind of like helping the overall community creators to developers and all that just push the medium, man. Like, nice one. in my opinion, VR is the future for games. There's mm -hmm. no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, mm -hmm. It's just we need the friction to get a little more down. And uh, is there a release date for Alan Doozy? Or are you able to say yes? Uh, I can't say, uh, okay. but it is soon. Okay. So that's fun. Coming this month, um, we'll probably get a release date out there fairly soon. And it'll be exciting. And I'll share more news and probably see some updates on social. But yeah, it's uh, right around the corner. All right, perfect. Last question then. So if that wasn't Thank enough, you. you're, also, you're, you're also making a return to your YouTube channel. Uh, you've just released your first video in a long time. And you've mentioned that you'd like to make content that is developer-focused. Uh, can you tell us more about the direction you're going to be taking your channel in? Will it be picking up where you left off or will it be a new kind of experience? Uh, I think a lot of the channel is going to be picking up where I left off, but on the side, I kind of want to start working more with developers. And I've heard that there's like other VR creators that have gotten into like the influencer marketing scene within VR, but they're like uh, charging devs an arm and a leg no. to take to get their content out there and to work with them. And when I heard that, I was like, man, fuck that. Like, yeah. don't get me wrong. Like, I know everybody's got to make a dollar, but like, let's say if I'm dealing with like Assassin's Creed VR or something, yeah, I'll, I'll charge them an arm and a leg. But if I'm dealing with someone like Reggie from Strange Games or 95% of the developers out there, like they shouldn't have to be paying out the ass just to like get a little help. Like we're still in a phase where I think that like, There should be a lot more love in the community. And yeah, someone's got to make a couple dollars here and there, but mm -hmm. you don't got to hit them hard. And so my thought, I'm thinking about kind of getting into more like working with other creators, working with developers and kind of helping them get their games to better places before they launch so that there isn't that like 
I've noticed that like if you hit a rough, if you can get a beta in there, that's fine. But if you can get a rough launch, it's it's really really hard to come back from that. Mm-hmm. So if I can do anything to like help developers, if it's just a matter of me playing their game early, giving them feedback based on everything that I've seen in the industry and that I've seen from other games, and like that's happy enough to me. But if I can get other creators in there, if I can get other VR players in there, if we can get if we can get a bunch of people to help them test their games, because that's another one. A lot of these people can't afford to like hire an outsourced QA team. They have maybe themselves and a couple buddies or this and that. So I'm kind of thinking of like doing like a Frank creator program um, in the future. I I don't quite know what it's going to be yet, but uh, I, I feel like that there's a big space for that, especially because like, although like, everybody's got to make a buck i'm in this for the passion i'm in this because i love it i'm not in this to like if i wanted to make money like as a lot of people will tell you i wouldn't be doing vr and spatial right now maybe 10 20 years from now but right now it's still like early days for that and i want to be doing i want to help i want to be a be a positive voice for the community and for the medium overall and it was just something i really really missed on the channel and just Watching a lot of other channels, like you're you're not that, you know what I mean? You're on top of your stuff, you're kind, you're open to this, but it I get the vibe that like it feels like it's gotten to this like there's lots of money exchanging hands and there's less in it for the passion and more in it for like the dollars. And I wanna make sure that my emphasis is that like I'm in this for the passion. I'm in this for the long run. I'm in this because I care about these people and these devs and now spending more time with VR devs and just game devs in general and kind of understanding the mindset and the heart and the soul behind the people that work on your games. It's like a no brainer to offer as much help as I can to any developer and any creator that reaches out to me, because that's what I, that's what I'd want to do in life. It's like when you see people like uh, Drake, funny enough, uh, I slowly became the, a larger Drake fan over the past years because like, I just can't help it. Like that's just, we're, I think, there's a similar vibe to that, but something lovely about him as an artist is he brings up smaller artists. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, and I, I, I really respect people that do that um, because you don't have to. Yeah. You don't, yeah. you could just make music for yourself or make movies or make commercials and sign up for things and just get paid. He'd be fine. He ain't yeah. got to do that. He has absolutely no, nothing that's telling him he's got to do that. But instead, chosen to like work with other people and like that i think that's the vibe uh i my whole emphasis is just happy kindness like i just want to be kind and loving and to any and everyone and like that's about it man so i'm really excited to see where the channel can go and where we're going from here Um, looking forward to seeing it yeah yeah all right so is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap it up well other than just like be kind and loving and care for your family and care for your friends and like the usual stuff, you know what I mean? Like at the end of the day, nothing matters except for like love and the people that you love and everything can be achieved with that power. Um, and don't go to the dark side and try to stay positive and all that fun stuff. Um, but yeah, that's about it, man. I really enjoyed chatting with you for a while. I went longer than I expected. Yeah, I'm sorry. I took so much of your time. Ah, dude, I, I, I made sure to plan my day out for this. So we're good. Thank you very much. I do appreciate that. And uh, I'll have it out soon enough, oh, yeah, I dude. hope, within the next day or two. Okay. All right, lads and ladies, I hope you enjoyed this interview with Frank. He was so kind enough to take time of his day to do it with me. Uh, that is it for this video. I'm going to end it here. Uh, thanks for watching. Consider hitting the like, subscribe, all that usual YouTube and shite, as Frank knows all too well. Uh, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye for now.